there's this idea in the patellar tendinopathy world that it is always a load tolerance issue and sometimes a biomechanics issue. This can be a problem because it can make you neglect biomechanics. So what can we do to solve this and kind of put the two together? I recently completed this course by Enda King where he talked about pathomechanics. What went on that led to the overload in the area? So if we go back to this 1987 study, they defined what exactly pathomechanics means. It is the mechanics of living systems in motion resulting in or leading to dysfunction or injury. So if we go back to patellar tendinopathy, what type of mechanics might someone present with that may make them more likely to get patellar tendinopathy? If we look at jumping and landing, they may have a very knee-dominant jump. They might jump very stiffly. The same thing goes for landing. They might land very stiff. They might land with knees forward. If you look at acceleration, deceleration, change of direction, they may present with the same type of mechanics, very knee dominant mechanics, not getting much from the ankle, not getting much from the hip, but putting a lot of load through the knees, through the patellar tendon. So if someone has these mechanics and you can maybe say it's from a lack at the ankle or a lack at the hip, and you get their patellar tendon feeling better, you can kind of assume they may just get it again because when they get back to sports, they're going to present with the same biomechanics, which are going to overload their anterior knees excessively. So the way we can look at rehab or for following a four stage process is we need to do things to load the patellar tendon and the quads, but we also need to do things to offload the patellar tendon and the quads. So if you're in stage one isometrics and you're doing the leg extension for the quads and patellar tendon, you should also do this for the calf hamstring glute, which will develop those areas and potentially offload the patellar tendon. When you get to stage two isotonics, if you're doing a very knee dominant squat for the quadriceps and patellar tendon, you should also do a hip hinge exercise to work the other side, the hamstrings. And before we get to stage three, let's talk about the split squat exercise. That is going to train everything. That's going to train the quads, hamstrings, muscles on the inside, the outside, and the calves. That's an exercise you can use in both of these phases to balance out everything. Doing it in the isometric phase, just hold an isometric split squat with a pretty neutral pelvis. When you get to the isotonic stage, just do a weighted split squat again with a pretty neutral pelvis. After enough time, when an athlete has developed strength and pain has decreased, they can go into stage three, where now we're looking at jumping, landing, accelerating, decelerating, change in direction, looking at all of these patterns and trying to make it more balanced so that they're not using the same mechanics, which might lead to the overload on the knee again. So in a jump and a land, the stiff mechanics are what you want to avoid. You want to make sure the knee is bending. You're getting some contribution from the knee, the hip, and the ankle. With the running, the acceleration, deceleration, change in direction, making sure the athlete's not favoring one side, but also making sure they're not too quad dominant. They're not running with a stiff leg on the painful side, but they can actually bend that leg, get contribution from the hips when they stop, get contribution from the ankles when they accelerate. So there's some concepts to keep in mind when it comes to patellar tendon rehab. You want to load the quads and the patellar tendon, but you don't just want to do that. You need to develop the hamstrings, the glutes, the calves. You need contribution contribution from the ankles and the hips to offload your patellar tendon when you get back to sport. Try it out. Enjoy.